All right, folks, here we go. Uh, we're making our way through Reformation, through Renaissance, humanism, all these crazy ideas going on, new enlightenment thoughts going to come about, and we're going to take a, a point here and move into the scientific revolution, which is stemming from all these ideas that are circling around here since the end of the 14th century all the way into the 17th century. Just new advances but also thought that's going to contradict the church, go in line with the church, work with the church, not work with the church. And it's going to work really, really well for what's going to happen in Europe. And again, what's going to be the long-term uh, assist to the rest of the world when it comes to discovery. And of course, these ideas uh, are going to stem from old ideas, which is a big part of humanist idea and the concepts of the Renaissance. So here we go. Okay, so here are some factors that are going on. These are factors you are familiar with. The first one being we have economic expansion. Remember, we have money coming in from the old trade routes, but we also now have money coming in from the Columbia Exchange back and forth, especially in the gold and silver trade. So people are much wealthier. And if you think about it, because of so much travel that's going on, you need better transportation to get people around and get goods around, but you also need new technologies. And, and items and technologies that are work much, much faster are going to be huge for this time period because that's how people are making money. You know, they've got to get goods sold. They've got to get goods bought. Same thing with countries. You know, this mercantilist idea that we talked about with exploration is out there. You know, the countries want to export uh, more than they import. And it needs to be done at a faster rate. Okay? We know this from the Renaissance. We're bringing back ancient thought. All right? Aristotle. All right? Plato. Socrates. All Roman texts. All this stuff that had scientific ideas that the Muslims had kind of kept in, in culture and in, in kept in their culture, which are now spreading back after the Crusades, and this re reinvigoration of you know ideas with ancient texts are huge. So people are going to dive into those texts and figure out what's going on and why they thought the way they did, and now with the modern ideas, think the way we think today. Okay, so we look at one of those. For example, you look at Aristotle. And the traditions of Aristotle, okay, Aristotel Aristotelian tradition. So the idea was that if you use reason and thought, you can decipher what's going on in nature. Remember we talked about Aristotle. He actually studied every single bit, and we know this about Aristotle. We've proven all of his theories completely wrong. So in saying that, here the scientific thinkers of the day are going to look at Aristotle as the benchmark and try to prove his theories as correct and what they end up doing is proving his theories as wrong and then deciphering more so it explains why the sky is blue explains explains why why clouds move the way they do why you know the seasons are the way they are because now nature can actually be explained and that's a big movement and of course it's going to be taken a step further with mathematical ideas uh, to add to the scientific ideas and, and, and come up with more thought about nature and it's not just the answering of God all right, so that leads us to this one. I know this one's a little, doesn't make as much sense, and I'll explain it to you here in a second, but it says Renaissance Neoplatonism. Well, we're talking about Plato, all right, and Plato was what you would call a deist, one who believed in a higher power, but didn't necessarily at the time with the Greeks think about the gods as determining everything, okay? He did believe that higher power was there, but it had to be more. So with Neoplatonic thought, especially in the Renaissance, which is more secular in nature, moving towards ideas of you know the individual and in questioning the church and living in the moment all right where it says the magician could acquire power over nature well the magician was humans they were the ones who were acquiring power of nature because what they decided in this idea is that there's more than just nature and there's more than just religion it's more than just mystical there's actual scientific mathematical reasons for why it happens okay so the Renaissance Neoplatonist looks at religion as a higher power idea, but not the answer for all the questions, okay? So the magician, again, the magician is the human. They are looking at everything from a mathematical, scientific, much more concrete foundation that helps answer their questions. All right, so what crises were brought about from this? Well, first one is the idea of heliocentrism, okay? For the longest time, and it makes sense if you think about it, people believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. That's what the Greeks had thought, that's what the Romans had thought, and that's what the church had thought, okay? Because it says it in the Bible. But we know it's a heliocentric model. 
the sun is in the center and we are rotating around it as opposed to everything rotating around us. So this heliocentric idea, which is brought about by Nicholas Copernicus, and I'll mention him a little bit later, comes into conflict with the actual church's readings, and it's going to challenge the church. And Copernicus has a tough situation because he is not only challenging the church, but he is challenging his own faith because Copernicus was a Catholic, and he wanted to go to heaven, which is why he waited till the very last days of his life to actually publish his findings, which he has spent 25 years working on. Okay, so that's a big conflict that the church is going to have to deal with. The second idea is this principle of mechanism, okay, that everything is mechanical. It's not just a phenomena that happens. It's their actual physical causes that lead to that natural phenomena. So if an avalanche happens, what actually caused the avalanche? And it was more than just God made it happen. Okay, if disease spreads, it's not a plague brought down by God. It actually has a natural physical explanation for what's going on. And mechanists believe that everything in the earth has a physical explanation to decide or to make the idea that something happens because of a reason. All right. Obviously, the idea of naturalism, this goes along with humanism, that humans, we ourselves are part of nature. And if you look at like the issues of today, we look at global warming issues or potential environmental problems that we as part of nature are the cause. OK. And remember, too, because of the climate exchange, the population is rising. So there's more people on this earth that are exploiting the earth. And that becomes part of nature as well. All right. And then lastly, Another issue is you have a divide between people who are scholarly, all right, those who are intelligent, and those who are vulgar. And vulgar is not being like rude or crude, but it's just being not as educated, okay? And I won't say ignorant, not knowing, it's more just not as educated, okay, where you have those who are extremely educated. And the problem that's going to happen is those who are in the educated psychological, or not psychological, but the very educated and thinking crowd are speaking to each other. So when we get to the Enlightenment, one of the big things about the Enlightenment is that those who are thinkers will get together and talk to each other, but they don't worry about like the common people. Right? And that's who the crude are, the vulgar are. And this does lay down foundation for modern democracy because even though we're here we are talking about science, it's also about government because here we are now speaking about how the groups have to kind of mesh together and what kind of freedoms will people have. And even democracy as itself is going to become scientific thought. When we look at John Locke, John Locke is using science to explain politics. Okay, So here we are again, you have this separation of those who are, who are more intelligent, who aren't, and then what kind of uh, situations they're putting themselves in. Okay, And, of course, the big one, which follows the humanist renaissance reformation tradition, is you reject tradition. You go against the grain to figure your own path. All right, so some solutions. Well, one solution that's offered, and it's offered maybe by the church, when the church kind of starts taking some hits, and even Galileo, who is a church's scientist, is that scripture is should be interpreted because it's still scripture, it's still faith, um, and it, it, it can work like coinciding with scientific theory. Scientific theory is happening, but scripture still needs to be interpreted for what it is and, and understand that its faith is still important. The second one is that scripture and science are completely separate from each other. Okay, uh, When we look at Bacon, Francis Bacon, he is going to set up scientific method and he is going to be Protestant and he's going to do it in lieu of the church. Okay, And Galileo as well, especially when he is confirming Copernicus's ideas and when he's put on trial, is he is saying that these two ideas are separate from each other. Okay, So you have two ideas where science can kind of mix in with the church or you have science and church need to be completely separate. Or lastly... Um, take some theories of like Descartes or Copernicus where there's got to be some dissimulation. There's dissimula yeah, dissimulation where things should happen. I hate to use the word things, but ideas should happen in lieu of the church and some happen with the idea of a higher power being involved. And then you can blend them together which way you want them. That's kind of how Copernicus worked. Descartes, which we'll talk about more down the road with Enlightenment, he is strictly a deist. He's saying there is a higher power, no doubt, who's created this. However, you know, we have to look at it from a very scientific principle. So you have those three kind of solutions to what's going on in the scientific revolution that can really help you understand, you know, where these people are thinking, how they're thinking. Okay. So let's look at another kind of set of notes here that should help you kind of understand what's going on. And if 
we go over, but the birth of modern science is mainly going to help it happen in Europe. Okay, so let's look at why Europe. And again, you can write down what you want out of this. You don't have to really get it all because it's a lot of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to kind of highlight a few areas that are really important. So when you look at this legal revolution, uh, this idea that people want to work together in a sense, and they want to be able to regulate what's happening, okay? And that's a legality issue. And it controls kind of the thought process. And groups will be set up that kind of blend those different ideas. You also have more and more universities, okay? So there's more and more education being established all throughout Europe. You're having universities pop up in major cities, all right, um, that are going to add to this idea, this this enlightenment kind of scientific revolution idea. So let's go ahead and put down the emergency universities. That's a big one to have. All right, and it's being done in relationship or separate from the church. There's no doubt valuable information. All right, there's new exchange, and you can write this one down here. The Europeans found themselves at the center of massive new exchange of information. Again, we know this because of trade that's happened from Muslim culture. We know this because of trade that's happened from the Columbia Exchange, interactions with the Asian groups. All right, S Europe is becoming a hotbed and, and a melting pot of information that's being spread around. So why not those areas? Well, the biggest issue is technology okay you don't have to write this down but understand it's technology and the simple fact that Islam is having its own issues with conservative thought versus progressive thought and China is not opening its doors they are staying uh, isolated or trying to stay isolated and not letting China itself spread it spread out and spread its wings okay so what is the cultural revolution these things we're gonna have to write down a few of them, okay so the uh, big one obviously is this heliocentric idea and we're gonna start with Copernicus so go ahead and write down about Copernicus um, he's the one who's going to initialize heliocentrism so make sure you put a note here next to Copernicus that this is heliocentrism he is going to explain why the heavens are why the earth does what it does and how we rotate around the Sun okay and that's gonna really challenge the earth okay and if you look at it, it goes against what the church had originally said we have challenged the law of physics all right being ideas being explained through mathematics and that's Sir Isaac Newton okay so you're gonna to have to write this one down because what he is going to do is he's gonna look at scientific method and he's gonna to begin to explain everything through mathematical principles especially the ideas of gravity all right, uh, you guys have ideas of motion, movement, those are all going to be kicked in through Isaac Newton. Now, Isaac Newton is also going to play a very, very um, interesting blend here, and we'll get to that in one second. Another big issue with the scientific revolution is a strictly male dominant. That's who is allowed to go to school and go to the universities. All right, the women who are going to get involved, and we'll talk more about women down the road with enlightenment theory, are going to do it because they're around their husbands who are the enlightened thinkers and they're going to have opportunity to participate in these these conversations that the men are going to have especially amongst the women and of course the big one here is this idea how do you blend faith and revolution okay how do you blend science and faith and none of them are going to fight Christianity in the sense of their belief structure but what they're going to challenge is the idea that the church is the one who says it okay now Sir Isaac Newton had the best kind of blend he basically said that the universe is like a clock okay and God is the clock maker so if we do that idea uh, the God has created everything however what Newton would also say is it's my job to figure it out okay and that's a big blend of religion it's keeping faith intact and also moving to the idea that science is important okay and the last little bit, a couple parts that are going to kind of blend science and eventually to the Enlightenment. And the big ones we got to focus on are obviously we have the printing press. All right. The idea of printing allows for more information to be spread. The Enlightenment is going to uh, stem from this, and we'll get to the Enlightenment much later. But we're going to use thinkers and use of scientific thought, like John Locke, some women, the kings themselves. And we'll get to that, all that stuff down the road. But this is a big one, okay? It's the emphasis on power of knowledge to transform human society and to be open-minded, okay? It's taking that humanist idea of the Renaissance and pushing into being more open-minded and challenging and questioning every idea that comes down the road. So we'll pick this up next time. We're going to look at absolutism and move into some new ideas of the Enlightenment.